that's okay. Yeah. Okay. Welcome everyone. Welcome to Celebrate the Arts, brought to you by Florida Artist Group, also known as FLAG. FLAG's proudly celebrating our 72nd annual exhibition and symposium. My name's Linda Chipperfield, and it's my great pleasure to introduce session number 10, Art Inspires a Healthy Life, with Linda Hawkins, Pamela Miles, and Abby Murphy, and moderated by Vicki Lennon. Vicki is the chair of the Florida Artist Group area number six and holds a BFA in fine art. She volunteered to create artworks for the cancer patients at the Wolfson Children's Hospital here in Jacksonville and saw firsthand the positive results that art brings. This presentation is being recorded for later publication and public access. So we request that you keep your microphone muted throughout the presentation. We encourage you to ask questions, but we ask that you hold them until the Q&A session after the last presentation. You can also add your questions to the chat and our speakers will address them as they can. And as a courtesy, please keep your questions um, succinct and on topic um, so we know who to have answer them. Now, uh, please welcome Vicki Lennon. Thank you, Linda. Um I have three wonderful speakers to share information with us. And the first one is gonna be Pamela Miles. She has a master's degree in art education from the University of South Florida. Before starting her teaching career, Pam was manager of Pyramid Arts Limited, an art publishing company that publishes works for leading artists such as Jim Dine, Robert Rauschenberg, James Rosenquist, Richard Aniskiewicz, and Theo Wojcik. She has spent 34 years primarily teaching art to children with learning differences. In addition, she has been employed as an expressive therapist for children who were hospitalized with mental health issues. She's taught art for the blind, designed murals for homeless shelters, and ex exhibited her paintings through the Florida Artist Group, as well as many other avenues. Pamela? Thank you. Thank you. Um, I've, I've been teaching art for children with uh, dyslexia for 34 years at a school in Clearwater, Florida. And I found that it very much um, raises their self-esteem because they do very well with hands-on learning. Um, I'm very careful to do things in a very uh, precise, a slow way to build up from a very simple um, instructions and up into to getting it totally completed. And I like to concentrate now specifically on artists that are contemporary because I want them to see what's happening in the real world. Um, for instance, the project that I just finished with them is um, a project that's based on the still lifes of Florence Stoskop, who is um, a self-taught artist and just recently had an exhibition at the Beers Gallery in London that was sold out. And I like information like that for the students because they can relate to that. And it also keeps their attention. Um, I was gonna go through how I do it um, because I think that's interesting. And it's also helpful if you are trying to teach someone that does learn differently. Most of my, the kids, most of my students learn very well hands-on by seeing and doing. Um, I don't do a lot of talking because they've had probably enough of that during the day with their regular studies that I think they struggle with for the most part. So I try to make it a lot of fun. Um, we um, started out the project by um, <clears throat> talking about fish because the artist that I was uh, teaching them about did a still life with a fish vase. So I wanted to give them really interesting, um, interesting fish um, to, to study. I don't know if you can see behind me, I bring in display boards with, um, with different kinds of fish. And I wanted to do the weird fish first 
because I thought that would really catch their attention. And it's things like this. This is what I'll do. Um, talk about like the pacu, which is a tropical fish from South America that will die in cold water. Um, an oar fish that's not good eating. It's the world's largest fish. It has no teeth, no scales, and hangs straight down. Um, the Atlantic spade fish drifts on its side sometimes to mimic floating debris. Um, the red snapper, adults can live up to 57 years. Um, the yellowfin grouper starts out as a, a female and ends up as a male. These are the kind of things that catch their attention and make them more interested in um, actually following through with what they need to do. Um, Flor I don't know if you can see it, but Florence Stoskopf's work is behind me. And um, it's a fish vase and he makes up his own flowers. So it was nice for the kids to be able to create their own flowers. They didn't have to do them realistically. I don't like to put a lot of, um, uh, I, I don't like to put a lot of have to do it this way kind of stuff on the kids. Um, but we started out because you need to have um, three parts to this project. You needed to have the bottom part here for the border and then the middle part for the table and the back background. So we just start out with a paper like that and then they can choose to paint any color that they wanted. Let's see, you can get that any color they want in the three parts, which is, I like to have them be able to do whatever kind of colors that they wanna do. Um, it gives them an idea that they're in charge of something and they can actually control something, which with a lot of their studies, they have a difficult time with. So, and this is, this is like one of the results from the kids. Um, this little girl's in elementary school and then you can see the border that you can pick any kind of design you want for the border. You can pick any fish you want, do any colors and the same with the flowers. You can make them up um, like that. Um, you can see these two little girls are in the same class. And so you can see that they um, chose whatever they wanted to do, which was similar in a way, but really quite different. And it just gives you an idea of um, what kind of results that you can get when you're when you're more open and free with it. And then what I did with with one of the little girls, she's kind of worked slowly. So I had her um, use some of the photos that I brought in of actual flowers so that she could catch up and finish her project and still be successful. Um, and then it's kind of fun. A lot of them chose uh, blobfish because it was so unique. <laughs> and I, I think that was kind of cool what they did with that. Um, and then I have um, an example here, if you wouldn't mind holding that one up at all. Yeah. Uh, of what, what some of the middle school kids did. And this is, is, has just been made into a very large vinyl hanging for the outside of the school that's gonna be four by eight feet. And this gives the kids um, really good self-esteem um, to see their work blown up big and displayed like that. Um, it's, I think it's extremely important since they haven't had a whole lot of success with academics. Um, and that's why they're at DePaul School for Dyslexia. Um, and then I have cards made from their artwork um, myself because I think that's also important um, as far as making them feel really good about what they've done and what they're able to do. Um, we also um, put, I have a wonderful parent that comes and photographs all the artwork for the kids and put it on artsonia.com so that their parents and anybody can actually buy things made from their artwork off the internet. It's artsonia.com and you just type in DePaul School for Dyslexia and you can buy all kinds of things from their artwork. And you can see what projects that I do um, and maybe get an idea of how I work. I usually do a lot of cutting and pasting. Um, I think it's really important that the kids know how to cut, which many of them do not. And just simple things that you think that kids would know how to do these days. I said the other day to the principal, I don't understand this. These kids didn't know what outlining was. And she said, Pam, you have to remember they're pushing buttons. 
And it's just very different from when I grew up. So it's been an education for me as well as it has been for the kids. Um, and in terms of continuing raising their self-esteem, um, I, I did a project called, um, it's by Derek Adams, who's a contemporary artist and um, his, uh, let's see, let's see, let's see. okay, his um, artwork um, was, the theme was, uh, we come to the party and plan. And so I had the kids do a project based on his artwork and the principal at the upper school used it for the front of the, the yearbook. Um, this is the example uh, for the front of the yearbook and for the back of the yearbook. And then she also used all my underpaintings that I usually have projects where it requires underpaintings for the inside of the yearbook. And the yearbook won best elementary yearbook for the United States. Now, see, those are the things that are really important to me because it it makes the kids feel really good about what they're doing. Um, and I I um I think that's about all I have um, as far as uh, what I I do with the kids. Um, I I feel. There, it, it, there's a quote that I found, and I thought it really, re, uh, really related well um, by Maya Angelou, and it says, um, I've learned that people will forget what you said, people will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel, and that's, that's my focus. I want them to feel good about what they're able to do, and because they're mostly see and do people, um, I feel like the arts just are absolutely wonderful for them, for them to be able to express how they feel, um, that they have the ability to uh, use the colors and, and that they want, that they can make the border designs that they want to do. It gives them a lot of control, and I think it makes them feel really good about themselves. So, um, and I'd be more than happy to answer any other questions you might have about what I do. Pam, could you please put spell or put in the chat the email address we're trying to look up for the DePaul School, the first part of it? Oh, okay. Um, yeah. Before I, the, before the it, session's over. Okay. I, I have it. Oh, yeah. okay. Can you type okay. it in for the chat? It's www.thedepaulschool.org. Okay. Well, there was something you were saying before that. Oh, artsonia.com. Okay, that's, that's where you can look up on artsonia.com, type in the DePaul School for Dyslexia, and then it brings up all the, um, I think probably the last five or six years, all the um, projects that I've done with the kids. And, um, and, and like I said, I pretty much concentrate on contemporary artists. I've done art history but I really like them to see what's going on in the real world. I think it's important for them to see what's around them and what they can aspire to be. Um, because many of the artists have like, the, for instance, Florence Stoskoff, he was self-taught. So it does give them, I think, um, hope that they can do something with themselves even if they don't go to get a PhD in art. Um, so it, that's important to me. And I, I want them to be able to go to uh, large cities and go to museums and recognize the work that we do. They, they can see, um, say for instance, um, uh, the next one of the next projects we're gonna be doing is Yayoi Kusama, um, who's extremely well known right now and, and pretty much all over the place. And um, so they can go to a museum and see, oh my gosh, I know who that is. And um, that's, that's important to me. Thank you very much, Pam. That was wonderful. I'm excited. I'm going to go look it all up all over again. <laughs> good, good, good. Thank you. Thank you. Um, our next, uh, I'm going to move on to our next, we have not our next speaker and then we can finish any questions at the very end. Um, our next speaker is, gonna, is Linda F. Hawkins. She works in various media, but most often uses watercolor, ac acrylics, and collage. 
After graduating from Tidewater Community College, where she majored in media advertising arts, she pursued a career in advertising. Linda built her own business while living in Hilton Head, South Carolina, and also was art director for Charleston Magazine in 2006. She received her BFA from the University of North Florida, and in 2016, she received her MA from the University of Florida, which focused on the arts in healthcare environment. In her career, she has developed programs for patients diagnosed with dementia and taught art workshops for senior patients. She lives in St. John's, Florida with her husband, Michael, and their Westie, Annie. Linda? Well, I, that's a interesting presentation to follow. Um, I, I have a sister who has four children that have learning um, challenges, and um, it, it's very interesting that they can they can do beautiful artwork and music, and they don't do well in school, but they sure excel in those ideas. So, I, I applaud you, Pam, for the work that you're doing. Um, I have a PowerPoint presentation that I'm going to be doing, so I'm going to share my screen. And makes me pick. Okay. So as Vicki said, I have an MA from the University of Florida. And I went there because I had started working for Baptist Health and saw what the arts can do. Um, in my presentation today, we're going to talk about what art's for, art through the ages, uh, art is more than visual arts, um, how the arts affect our cognition, and then arts finally in the uh, healthcare environment. So art is pleasurable, it's therapeutic, it allows us to escape the tedium of everyday life. It provides a meaning, sense of meaning for us. It arouses our sympathy and feelings for our fellow people. It, it strengthens our social bonds. It reduces depression and it provides a meaningful and purposeful activity. Um, it releases dopamine, it brings back memories and it, it act, activates our brains to think. Well, we all start out with scribbling from one to three, then by the time we're three or four, we start drawing shapes. And then by five or six, we're starting to put things together and we're aware of people and uh, the things around us. And then by the time we're seven or nine, we start getting more realistic in our work and more critical of our work. By the time we're 10 to 13, we're doing, uh, we're aware of light and shadow and getting very critical of our work and getting more natural in how we draw. And then finally, when we're at age 13 or 16, that's when we decide whether or not we're going to continue to work on artwork or music or whatever it is creatively that we decide to do. And um, this is a really important time for anyone with children to be encouraging them to continue on to do those things because otherwise, if they don't get encouragement, they typically will stop creating. But art is more than just visual arts. It includes music, dance, writing, performance, storytelling, and crafting. So those of you even that garden, that is, that is art. Uh, whether you realize it or not, cooking, that is art. Everybody is creative. We've learned through research that the arts prepare our brains for being able to do lots of different activities. Uh, it's been proven that babies that are exposed to music at an early stage are uh, more aware of the, the nuances and the spoken word. We've seen that people that play music are able to concentrate longer than people that don't play music. And um, something that's very interesting about people that are musically inclined, they also happen to do much better in math. Uh, we found that students that participate in the arts do much better at writing. And we've also learned that drawing has a very dramatic effect on our memory. And that's probably because when you're drawing, you're really observing what you're looking at. Um, and so that kind of imprints on your brain. Uh, people that have cognitive decline can still create art and it can help them maintain their cognitive abilities. And we all know that 
uh, when a familiar song comes on the radio and it could be something we learned in junior high school. And when that song comes on, it brings back memories to us. And it, it is works even with people with dementia, which I'll talk about a little bit later. So we're now to the arts and the healthcare environment. Um, when, to answer what it is, it is a field that incorporates arts in a multidisciplinary way to um, in the healthcare environment and community settings. And it's for the benefit of all the people in the community to enhance their health and well-being. And this is according to the National Organization for Arts and Health, better known as NOAA. So I went to work for Baptist in 2014. They had, they were bringing a conference to Jacksonville with the National Organization for the Arts in Health, and um, they hired Baptist hired me to be the program coordinator and to lead this initiative. Unfortunately, the original group went bankrupt, and we didn't have the program, the conference, and so. They put me on the oncology ward to run a workshop for patients and their care partners. So this picture here is of a gentleman and his son. Um, the man's wife was actively dying with colon cancer and he would come in with this young son every day and create something to bring to his beautiful wife. And this picture was taken on the day she died and he came in and he made this really beautiful piece of artwork and it was so touching. He came back weeks later and brought me flowers because I had given him hope and a place to retreat when he when it got too much in the room. So uh, I know that this really worked. Um, we had family members come in and even the staff would come in and we'd make prayer flags. By the time I left working in the oncology ward, this wall was completely covered with prayer flags. Uh, business policies changed and I got transferred over to Agewell, which is the uh, geriatric practice. It's the only clinic in the area that has physicians, psychologists, speech language pathologists, uh, occupational therapists, physical therapists, nutritionists, and social workers. So we had we had it all, all in one place. And if my parents lived here, they would be going there. And uh, they have since expanded. We have one location and now they're all over Jacksonville. But anyway, uh, on this particular day, the lady on the left-hand side of the picture is was a retired social worker from Puerto Rico. And she worked mainly with people with uh, alcohol, uh, abuse problems. And anyway, she wanted to teach us how to make a God's eye. And so we we did that in the class and it was very well received. And so oftentimes I would have some of the, the members coming to the class to go ahead and um, show us a skill that they knew, which gave them a sense of meaning and a sense of purpose. And um, Miss Lucy, who is the lady here teaching, said that that was one of the reasons she loved to come to the class because it did give her a sense of meaning, a sense of purpose and a way to socialize with other people. And that happens a lot with people when they're older, they lose that sense of purpose, they have less social interaction with others and that causes them to go into depression, which causes them to have uh, decline as in both physically as well as mentally. So I wanted to bring music into the program and uh, when I presented it to management, they encouraged me to work with the speech language pathologist to develop a cognitive program. We got certified through music and memory to bring the music to our patients. And we developed this program called Enrich. It stands for Empower, Nurture, Reminisce, Inspire, Collaborate, and Hope. And uh, it was the only hospital-based program in the area. And it was for patients that had moderate to severe stages of dementia, which is on the global scale, it's four to five. There are six levels. And um, we included the music and memory, which consisted of uh, building a pl playlist 
and putting it on iPods so everybody had their individual playlists because music is very um, personal. You know, everybody's got their own favorite songs and no two people like the same songs. Uh, we did art projects of all kinds. I had a young lady come in and do chair yoga with us. We did all kinds of different sensory activities such as the, the sand, um, bubbles, just different things like that. We did memory games, the word games. And then I, we had the care partner only sessions and these were unique and what made our program unique is that none of, none, none of the other programs in the area do anything with the care partners. And what we did with the care partners, well, we brought in guest speakers that would talk about elder law. Um, we had the chaplain come in so that people could share their concerns and their disappointments and cry and do whatever. Um, that they needed to do at that time. And the psychologists would come in and talk to the, the care partners. And it was really, I think it was really beneficial for them. Um, this picture is, sorry, it's blurred. They were small. And when I blew them up, they got a little wonky. But one of the projects that we made was memory boxes. And in that we would decorate the box on the first session. And then they would take the boxes home and fill them with things that were important to them. And then they would come back on the next session and we'd have show and tell. And they would the things that I could learn about the patients was amazing. Um, this lady was from Vietnam and did not speak English. And so we had to have an interpreter come in. And she, her son who brought her every time asked us if we could find some Vietnamese music. So I researched it and I got Vietnamese music and put on her iPod. And you can see this is the first day she is grinning from ear to ear. She was so thrilled to be able to have music from her homeland. And I have to tell you an interesting story about the translator. She was one of the boat people that came here from Saigon when Vietnam fell. And she was in a boat with her siblings for weeks and was uh, rescued by an Indonesian tanker and had not had food or water and couldn't even stand when they got her. So uh, it was such an honor for me to meet both of these, these ladies and I'm gonna get choked up because it, it, was, it really touched my heart. Um, this gentleman here uh, was from Germany and his little Volkswagen down in the bottom there, he worked for Volkswagen, he was a designer for them. And he was also an Olympic cyclist and uh, the year that he was supposed to go to the Olympics, they split Germany and he could not participate because he was number three and they could only take two people. And the lady that's in the background there, she never spoke a word, but one day we were playing the sing-along and she piped up, my husband used to sing that song to me. And so that was another wow moment for me. This lady here was uh, 96 years old. You never could understand and anything that she said and her when it came to the show and tell her daughter brought in this board that she had to put all of the tools that she the woman had used as a hairdresser she'd been a hairdresser all her life and when she picked up the hot curling iron she started talking she became so animated and showed us how to curl the hair and talked about how you had to heat it on the stove and that if you weren't careful you could burn yourself really bad so that was another great great moment for me this is miss shirley miss shirley oh my gosh she always came dressed to the nines typically she had gloves on she doesn't have them in this picture but she almost always had her little gloves on and um, her son was so smart, he, he took the memory box and put it on the coffee table in their home so that when friends came over to visit, they would say, Miss Shirley, what's in the box? And she'd start pulling things out and that would enable her to have meaningful conversation with the guest. So I thought that was a, a marvelous idea. Um, the, this woman also could not speak. She had aphasia, which affects your, your speech part of your brain. And she loved painting birdhouses and would get so serious and she would always paint several. So um, I, I was always glad when we, I could find them for a dollar at Michael's and bring them in. So, um, we did a program called Day at the Museum and this always sparked a lot of conversation. This painting here is in the Kummer Museum and I always like to show this one. It was commissioned by the Mayo Clinic, but it was rejected because if you look at the gentleman in the white suit on the side, 
he is holding a cigarette and the Mayo Clinic did not want that. So, but you can see this at the, uh, at the Kummer Museum. We love this picture, gave everybody time to think about what these dogs were doing. They were drinking, they were smoking, they were cheating. And they were always surprised to find that this is the number one selling print of all time. And I was fascinated by the fact that they could still, even though they had dementia, they could still think abstractly and see abstractly. They were always able to pick out the dog and tell which were musicians and what instruments they were playing. So I thought that was a lot of fun. And then this one was uh, a Norman Rockwell and there were so many things in here going on. We made up all kinds of stories about this picture and that was, a, it was always a good time. I also did programs called Armchair Travel where I'd throw up some uh, images of different places around the world. And we would ask if, uh, you if patients had been there and then get them to tell us stories about their trips there. So that sparked conversation. Uh, this is the Music and Memory. You can go to musicandmemory.org to learn more about them. And they have a YouTube channel. There's a, uh, a little short clip on there about a man named Henry who sat in his chair with his head down and didn't really talk. When they put his favorite music on, all of a sudden he became animated and would start singing. And then at the, the end of the video, they take off his headphones and he has full on conversation, which he'd never done before. So music is really, really important to our brains. I also shared StoryCorps. This is a group that is has a mission of preserving our stories. And they have they go around to different locations. They were here maybe in Jacksonville, maybe about three years ago they were here. And you could go in and you take your parent or an aunt or whatever, a, you know, a senior citizen and take them and you could ask them questions and they would record the story and then it's hosted on their website. And one of my favorites is the story of Miss Divine and you can find them on YouTube as well. And uh, the way that we used it in the, the program was I had a list of questions and I would have the care partner ask the patient the questions. And sometimes the care partners would learn things about their parent that they didn't even know. So I thought that was a really great activity. Oops, I wanted to go back. Let's see, I don't know if I can go back. Yes, I can. So the, again, I wanted to just repeat that we had the care partner sessions only and brought in these people here. Um, the elder law was a very popular one because there are so many things that happen that you need to know about when you're taking care of a senior. And I advise anyone who has parents still around that they need to get in touch with an elder law attorney because so many things can go wrong and you need to know what to do with their money, their homes, um, even their medical care. And if you do not have your name on their HIPAA report, you need to get on there because the doctor can't even share what's going on with them if you do not have access to their records. So they need to make sure you ask for that. And um, there's some suggested reading. So, and that's the end. And I'll go back to the Zoom and stop sharing if I can get back there. Uh, minute, stop share. There we go. Okay, I'm done. <laughs> Thank you very much, Linda. That was very, very interesting. Um, and our next speaker is, is Abby Murphy. She received her BA from the School of International Studies at the American University with a minor in environmental studies. She has interviewed at the, she has interned at the International Institute for Environmental and Environment and Development, created an illustrated guide to dune plants in the Turks and Caicos Islands and painted scenery for the Connecticut Repertory Theater that make summer series. Her perspective is the subject matter continued to develop through these connections. And she began addressing topics such as hazardous waste at the US EPA, consulting for the US Army Corps of Engineers, launching the University of North Florida Environmental Center, creating education programs on the St. John's River with St. John's River Water Management Department and assisted the North Florida Land Trust preserves special places for generations. She has applied her craft to themed events and continues to volunteer 
including providing instruction to the AARP, Healthy Living, Art in the Park. Abby? Good morning, or I guess good afternoon now. Nice to join you all remotely. Um, as my esteemed uh, Region 6 uh, introduction said, I am a tree hugger at heart and an environmentalist through and through. Art has always sort of been a sideline for me but I've always found ways to put the art with the environment, which I think is a great help to all. I'm gonna share a couple of things with a PowerPoint um, presentation, just so you have something to look at besides talking heads this afternoon. So I'm gonna pop in here real quick. This tab is easier. Um, one of the things we think about with holistic health and as a tree hugger, um, for the World Health Organization even agrees that viewing man in his or her totality within a wide ecological spectrum is just as important as being ill from a, a germ or whatever. We need to be sort of at one. So when I talk, I'm going to talk a little bit about how health and art can make your life a higher or potentially your ability to help others be healthier with the art. Um, this is an example of a plain air uh, picture that I did. And I'm going to talk a little bit about plain air and how it works with health. Abby, I'm not sure. I don't, I'm not seeing your images. Does anybody else? Okay, let me go back. I mean, make sure the share was hit. I'm going to just forgive me one moment. Make sure I hit the, the tag correctly. I might have only clicked on it once. I apologize. Are you seeing it now? Yes, thank you. Very good, I apologize. So here was the quote I talked about with holistic health, viewing man in his or her total wide ecological spectrum. And I need to change my view because I can't see my slides. Let me do this real quick. Excuse me, I'm gonna go back. Pardon, sorry. But you guys are over my words, which is not helping. All right, well, it's not gonna let me do it. So I just have to remember what I said. Anyway, um, this is an example of a plain air painting. Get back in here. Plain air has really been a blessing, especially with COVID um, the last couple of years. We've, I just probably started plain air about five years ago. Um, our St. Augustine Art Association does an annual event for about four or five days. And some of you who are plain air painters are gonna be very familiar with this. But those of you that are studio painters, this is a really nice nuance to get you out of doors and also to get out and about with people of all generations. Um, it's a wonderful way to connect, especially in this time, I know, as a kind of a semi-retired person now, I'm no longer having those work connections and to be outside painting other than being all secluded in my studio is really refreshing. Um, so I belong to a group called First Coast Plain Air and we have about 80 members and we have regular paint outs about every, twice a month. In fact, we were out yesterday, I was painting Watusi cattle, if you can imagine. Um, so I'm painting a moving subject and Plain air, besides being out in fresh air, really does help you uh, from another health aspects. So the focus to get away from all of those crazy electronic distractions that you may have, or your kids screaming at you, or you need to fix dinner. Um, and it's very stimulating getting you out in new areas. Um, plain air group, when we have these paint outs, I've gone to places I wasn't even familiar with that were in my own backyard perhaps a park I'd never been to or a historic location, or because of my friend's relationship as a nurse to her patient, we were able to go to this Watusi cattle place, normally not have ever been able to see. It's also very physical. Um, I have some comrades who will basically hike from to waterfalls through snow across the mountains to do their plein air paintings right there in the elements. Um, a lot of us do bring along a wagon, which you see down here in front, and we actually um, make ourselves a little bit more portable so that we can travel. I have traveled uh, or hiked a good mile just to get to a good place to see a really nice view of the marshes and some bird life. We are very blessed up 
East Florida with some beautiful areas. One of the things it does from a medical point of view is it really does teach you about observation. Um, any of you who have meditated or have done yoga, sometimes trying to shut the outside world out and be focused is challenging. I know when I paint, I basically forget to eat, forget what time it is. It could be 3 a.m. in the morning and I have lost all track of time. So that focus can be very calming, um, going to the ocean, painting oceans and listening to the rhythm of the oceans, listening to birds singing, water trickling. It's very good for your mental state of affairs. And I, from a problem solving standpoint, it keeps us sharp. A lot of my compatriots are older um, in the plein air group, but we have people from all different generations. So you get an interesting mix of perspectives. So there's that chatty part, learning about what people have done during the day, um, mentoring about what they know works, but you're also learning to study. Matching a color really takes a part of your brain. Like, is that a bluish green? Is it a yellowish green? Is it dark? Is it light? Is it front? Is it forward? Um, the shadow is here. How do I capture that quickly? because the sun is going to move. And those of you who have done plein air painting, you know the sun is moving, the shadows are changing very, very rapidly. Um, so we're having to make mental notes and remember things as we're painting and going along. Um, it also has some physical elements which are interesting, uh, trying to figure out how to hold down your uh, palette from blowing away or blowing into your chest, which has happened to me more than once. Or in one case, I set up myself for plain air painting and the bubble machine decided to get turned on on the streetscape at Saturday. And I was being inundated with bubbles, but I'd already picked my scene. I'd already started the painting and I just was gonna have to go from there. Bugs, wind, children, you name it. You get to problem solve as you go along. So it keeps you on your toes. And from a lady's point of view, I know a lot of us don't always wanna go out and be alone, say out in the woods painting. Um, so having a plein air group, like a regional group, there's some safety in numbers, which I think is always good. And for those of you that may be concerned about some of the toxicity of oil paint or of some of the other um, paints, you're out in fresh air. So no other better place than to ventilate. So I throw that out as just sort of a nice way to um, use plein air painting as a healthy outlook. One of the other things I do is our urban sketching group. And we basically go out on a sketch crawl. So the group will get together at a certain location. We'll typically do a quick meeting and we'll go from place to place every five to 20 minutes doing a sketch. So you're getting a nice walk in there. You do some fine motor skills, you get some eye-hand coordination. And I think one of the best things about urban sketching is that you actually have to observe people. And for some people that don't always pick up on emotional cues from other people by observing a person, are they happy, are they sad, are they in a hurry? You also become, I think, a little more knowledgeable about dealing with difficult people or with anticipating how they're going to act. So it's a very great way to observe people. And I think it also becomes part of a community. If you're out there, you might see something in your, you know, your hometown you've never even noticed before, or an opportunity, or gee, I wish I've never knew that that was there. I should go in there one day. So I I ran into a church I was not familiar with, and it was a great experience to go back. And uh, UrbanSketchers.org is an organization if you're interested in starting a sketch club, and you know you don't need a whole lot of talent for a pen, a pencil, a pad. And you know, four or five people that like to just hang out together and maybe go out for a cup of coffee one morning, once a month. The thing I'm trying to really um, encourage everyone to think about is wellness and community. Join a regional or a media specific group. Um, it could be specific to the media you prefer, watercolor, pastel societies. And I apologize, I just see I wrote watercolor up there twice. Um, but or a group like Plain Air or Urban Sketching or one of your art associations, have an opportunity to network with other people. As was brought out by our speaker earlier, it's so important um, to stay engaged with other people, not to be isolated. And especially as painters, I think we need to be lifelong, even though many of you all have much more professional art experience than I do, you are always learning. I'm always learning about some new varnish that came out or gee you shouldn't use that particular 
a color or this Williamsburg blue is a lot better than that, you know, Gamblin, whatever it is. So it's a great way to either find out about materials, um, find out about great sites to paint, have a chance to talk, to mentor those of you that are professional and very skilled, and especially those of you that have great teaching skills. Um, this is such an opportunity. And oftentimes we do it with young people as well, but also to share your knowledge back. Um, it's a great way to residents. We have artists moving into our town. They feel especially isolated in this time. They may not know people. They've just retired here. They're not necessarily working to get out and have an opportunity to meet people or you know, have someone to go out with coffee after the paint out. It's really a nice opportunity. The other thing too is as a group, a lot of us have education missions or perhaps a, um, a community outreach aspect to our group. Um, it's great with like a plein air group or the watercolor group. Ours will do a mural, say for a school or for a nonprofit. Um, I volunteer doing stage design for the local schools because a lot of times they don't have the expertise or the kids really need someone to help lead them on how do you take, like say you want to do a, a we did Shrek as an example. So you're gonna do this giant castle. Well, here's this size building. Helping the kids understand how do you break that down? Do you do squares and kind of this scale? And how do you scale it up? And how do you do perspective? And then you get those kids feeling more comfortable as was already spoken about how to approach a problem and make it real. And as a high school kid, I know I got no bigger thrill than trying to do something in pencil in a sketchbook and then building it as, you know, like a three-story high gumball machine, which I did do. Um, the other thing is like from a friendship and support group, we've had a lot of people who have been very challenged either with cancer, uh, people dying with COVID. It has been such a godsend for them to be having a person to connect to. Um, so you could be the difference in somebody else's life as an artist, just by that connection. It's an entree to finally know that person, know about their family, go out for a cup of coffee, go out for a paint out. The American Medical Association, just sort of in summary, talks about art. I don't know, I always admired the fact that, you know, Renoir was, had terrible rheumatology. Uh, Degas, you know, was basically painting blind in the end of his life, doing things out of repetition. But you can see even in these great artists, art was still benefiting them late in life. Um, movement, building, inventing, it is fulfilling. It gives the people a sense of worth, a positive outlook, and has been found, shown, as you've heard from one of our other speakers, it actually can help people overcome physical limitations. Someone with loss of hearing can become very visual. Someone who has difficulty with speech can help express themselves in art or with something else. And especially for me, who suffers from a little bit of a tremor and some pretty bad arthritis, I forget that I'm in pain. So it is a wonderful way to help you overcome something that you don't have control over without taking medicine. So one of the other things that I do is this AARP has this program called Art in the Park. And this is a volunteer thing and you see me down here in the bottom left. And sometimes it's been seniors, sometimes it's been homeschoolers um, who aren't getting that normal art education in their schools. Um, and you go in and basically you combine perhaps with a local park, in this case, our Timaquan Parks Foundation, has sort of a, uh, a group of local state and um, city parks. And we'll meet there, we'll do some yoga, and then we'll take a nice little hike and we'll talk about what we're gonna observe. And then we come back and we paint. And it is so inexpensive to get a small group together with some watercolors, um, a couple of egg boxes. Um, you know, It doesn't take much and I'll tape off of their papers in advance very inexpensive to do a really neat project and help a lot of people and get them out exercising and appreciating nature. Inclusion, art improves our health and how we age and how we can influence the health and how others age. Um, there are all these benefits which you've heard of, I won't reread them, but I encourage you to share your talents with others to help them be healthy and also to help share the gift that art has been for you in keeping yourself healthy and growing well. Abby, thank you so very much. That was very well, very well stated. Sharing, sharing with others. And that's, I think our whole um, 
method meaning for this hour pro program. Um, is there anyone that has any other questions that um, we can answer? And we'll open it up to the group with everyone that had questions. Linda, have you read any? There's a, there's a lot of comments on the chat. Um, not as many questions. So maybe if, uh, if you have a question, you don't want to post it on the chat. Um, if you raise your hand, um, I will uh, unmute you and you can ask. Um, I do well. see one that says, does the Timaquan Foundation set events? Um, they actually have coordinated it, but AARP does this with other um, groups. So if you have a park locally, you might contact your local AARP chapter and say, would you be interested in an arts in the park program? Okay, thank you. That was my question. I, I thought that was uh, excellent. Um, let's see, I mean, uh, you guys can, can see the chat, but um, Teresa says, congratulations. Linda says, nice work. I love what you're, what you're doing. I think this was for, uh, to Pam at the beginning. Uh, Nancy says, I'm impressed. Excellent presentation, Pam. Um, Pam put the Artsonia website in here, A-R-T-S-O-N-I-E.com. And Pam, do you have the um, the URL for the DePaul School for Dyslexia? Would that be the www? Yeah. Oh, it's um. Yeah. Hold on one second. I have it here. www.thedepaulschool.org. The org. And okay. if, if you want it for Artsonia, you just have to type in the DePaul School for Dyslexia. Okay. Yeah, for that. Yeah, that's what okay. happened. There, there are three locations. There will be three locations. There's um, one for the lower school, uh, one for the middle school. They're both in Clearwater. And now there'll be one with, um, uh, uh, for a high school, actually, with, um, what was it? The, um, darn. I'll think of it in a minute. We just started that. So that was, um, it was, it was, um, I'll think of it in a sec. <laughs> we, we just got involved with one. I know the DePaul School in in uh, in St. Louis, where I'm from, is is very active. Oh, so it's a okay. great organization. Because I think when I started there, there were 30 students, and it's probably close to 100 now. That's great. Yeah, it That's is great. wonderful. Because from what I've heard, one in five students has dyslexia. So, okay. Important. Linda, there's. A, I had a question for you. You talked about prayer flags, and you showed a picture of them. But what is the what's the concept there? Um, well, it was it was just something to be thankful, thinking mindfully about the person that was suffering from the cancer to mm -hmm. give the the love the care partner or family member um, an opportunity to express themselves so they just would look through magazines and use you know word pick, pick words out and images that were comforting to them and glue them on there okay yeah nice and linda says that my husband says i would starve if not for him reminding <laughs> me to stop and eat yeah i'm, I'm like that too <laughs> he comes in and says are you ever coming out of there <laughs> You get in this zone, it's wonderful. Can't help it. Yeah. Can't help it. And Linda said, great, great presentation, Abby. Everybody did great, great presentations. And does anybody have any, any questions that just speak up and I'll unmute you. I just wanted to say that it's Admiral Farragut the DePaul School is gonna be in, a, in affiliate, affiliated with Admiral Farragut and St. Pete for high school. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Anybody else? I was gonna ask, does, does anybody else on the 
call that might not have spoken have anything else they wanted to add that was a tip of something that they found very helpful in their, you know, their own health or trying to help the health of others. I have a, one of the patients that I had at um, Agewell had a very bad stroke and she is starting to come back. And basically it's because her friend who's taking care of her has been taking her to the stamping, uh, like a stamping club where they make cards and things. And so she's learning how to reuse her hands and, and making cards and that is so exciting. She still can't talk very well, but she's she's able to, to do creative expression. And that to me is a, a testament of how the arts can help us recover from things like that. And I did have a, I taught at a, Method, a Riverside Methodist Church, taught some classes there. And one of my ladies that was in the class had had a stroke and she was learning to paint with her left hand and was doing a really good job. And I myself had a shoulder surgery and had to learn to paint and draw for a while with my left hand. And so it can be done. You just have to, you know, it's, it's um, something that everybody needs. You gotta do it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Gotta do it. Thank you, Linda. Okay, well, um, on behalf of the Florida Artist Group, thank you for joining this session. Art inspires a healthy life. We hope you've enjoyed the presentation. A link to the video recording will be sent to you in the next few days, along with a short survey. I hope that you will give us your input. Uh, some programs still have openings, so uh, look at the roster of events and register on floridaartistgroup.org. And uh, thanks for joining us and have a great afternoon, everyone.